Inspired by my assembly language programming for the CPU I designed, I decided to teach myself x86 assembly language with the goal of converting my CPU's assembly language programs to x86. In this video, I'll show the results of this effort. This will include not only introductory concepts, but also valuable tips on how to program what you want. I'll start by showing how to reference the various registers. For now, I'll just show the A register. You can reference whatever part of the A register you want by using these names. The RAX reference is only available in 64-bit processors. Note the only high-order reference is AH. Here's all the register references you get in 32-bit x86 processors, except for the R forms. Register SI, DI, SP, and BP are source index, destination index, stack pointer, and base pointer respectively. 64-bit processors give you eight more general purpose registers. The next issue is assembler, syntax, and conventions. There are two main styles, Intel and AT&T which mainly differ in the order of source and destination arguments. So, be careful when trying out code snippets and programs. You might have to rearrange the order. In this video, I'll be using the NASM assembler and also Microsoft Visual Studio's internal assembler. Both are Intel format. The first program I converted from my CPU to x86 is a recursive factorial calculator. When I first started working on this video, I thought I would only be converting this program, so I might be covering it more than I should, perhaps causing you to get sick of factorials. But be patient, I've converted all significant assembly programs I've written, and it definitely gets a lot better. You can see in the comments how you would assemble this program using NASM, both for Windows and for Linux. In the case of Windows, I use the linker and library from Visual Studio. I made this code work on both Windows and Linux by using assembler directives to adjust to each. The Visual Studio linker I'm using here needs underscores on functions. GCC doesn't. The data section contains initialized variables which become part of the executable. The BSS section contains uninitialized variables which get allocated at runtime and usually initialized to zero. If you use an assembler other than NASM, your syntax is likely to be a bit different. When calling procedures, you usually push the parameters onto the stack to pass them to the procedure. Due to the nature of stacks, these parameters need to be pushed in reverse order. Remember to pop off the parameters after the call. By the way, by convention, any returned value is usually stored in the A register. When referencing variables when no register is used, you often need to specify the size of the variable, in this case, D word, and you often need to put the variables in brackets. This would be referencing the contents of the memory location where the variable resides. In other words, it dereferences the address. The exception to this is when brackets are used with LEA. This instruction adds four to the stack pointer. This does the same as pop ECX, for example. If you need to pop off more than one value, it's faster to just add the appropriate number of bytes to the stack pointer. Within the procedure, you will likely need to temporarily store the previous base pointer, also known as the frame pointer, and copy the stack pointer into the base pointer. This makes the new base pointer the top of the stack. You might need to decrease the stack pointer in order to create local variables. But this function doesn't have any local variables, so no decrease. Now you can get the past parameter by specifying the offset to the desired parameter. In this case, it's 8 because it needs to skip past the pushed EBP and the pushed return address, which was automatically pushed by the call. If there was a second parameter, the offset for the second one would be 12, since the first parameter is 4 bytes. By the way, any local variables would be referenced by subtracting from the base pointer, but remember to allocate space for the local variables by subtracting the amount needed from the stack pointer. When ready to return, you would put back the stack pointer value and retrieve the base pointer from the stack and then return. This move and pop could be replaced by leave, which does the same thing. By the way, this function here is recursive. There are various conventions for calling procedures. This is just one of them. 
It's not practical to teach all of x86 assembly language in one video, so I'll leave it up to you to figure out the various instructions I used. They are fairly obvious, I think. I guess the hardest one here might be JGE. That means jump if greater than or equal to, and it's referring to the comparison performed by the CMP done before it. Be careful though, JGE is a signed comparison. If you want an unsigned version of JGE, you would use JAE. Here's it running on Windows. I won't bother showing the Linux version of this program running, because later I'll be showing a modified Linux version running. In case you feel calling C functions to do the I.O. is somehow cheating, or you don't have access to a C compiler, here's a version I did using just interrupts to do the I.O. In this case, I'll use Linux. Of course, Linux usually has a C compiler. Here's how you would assemble it. This time I'll use the linker directly instead of GCC. Doing it this way, you might want to use underscore start instead of main, since that's the default entry point. But it will still work with main. And even if it didn't, you could specify the entry point with the minus E option of the linker. I had to create procedures to print a string, get a value from the keyboard, and print a value. This is closer to the way I did it in my CPU's version. Here's how you would create a buffer and access an element of that buffer. You can't divide by an immediate value, so I had to use variables that contain the appropriate values. I should point out a somewhat annoying aspect of multiply and divide. When you do a one operand multiply, the result is stored in both EAX and EDX. EAX will contain the lower 32 bits of a 64-bit result, and EDX will contain the upper 32 bits. Most likely you'll only need EAX, but you might not have expected the value that was in EDX to be destroyed. And divide is even more of a problem. You often will need to zero out EDX before doing your divide. Whether you need a 64-bit dividend or not, you will need to set, or at least be certain of, the contents of EDX or you will get undesired results. If you are doing sign division, you would need to extend EAX's sign into EDX by using the CDQ instruction rather than zeroing EDX, if the value is or could be negative, that is. Also, the quotient of the division will be put in EAX and the remainder will be put in EDX. Some people will do an exclusive or EDX comma EDX to zero it out because it's apparently faster. You may have noticed the various interrupt calls using the int instruction with interrupt 80 hex. In Linux, you can get the needed interrupt vector from the unistd files in the user include asm directory. Here's the 32-bit version. The desired number would be put in EAX. And here's the 64-bit version. If your system is 64-bit, you can use either the 32-bit interrupts or the 64-bit syscalls, but the syscall method is considered to be better. And here's it running on Linux. Windows doesn't really let you do interrupts to access the hardware directly. You might find some undocumented interrupts, but there's no guarantee that those interrupts will be the same in future versions of Windows. So we need to go to MS-DOS to do the same thing that I just did with Linux. If you don't have access to a DOS booting machine, you would likely need to use the CMD command prompt window to run the assembled program. Here's how to assemble. This time no linker is needed because I'm using NASM to create a COM file. COM programs are loaded by the OS using an offset of 256 bytes. So you need to put the org statement in. So every variable will be offset by 256 bytes. If you didn't put in the org, you would have to add 256 or 100H to every variable. Note the 6 instead of 8. This is because DOS is a 16-bit OS. Therefore, memory addresses are 2 bytes, not 4. So the return address that call puts on the stack is 2 bytes. We use interrupt 21H to do the I.O. When using the display string function of 21H, which is 9, the desired string has to end in a dollar sign. By the way, note that there aren't any segment sections specified. This is because it's a COM file. A COM file only has one segment. Here's what it looks like if not using org. Here's it running. You can't run a 16-bit program on a 64-bit Windows OS, so you might have to use an older computer. Now something for 64-bit users. Here's how to assemble it. 
For Windows, I'll use a newer Visual Studio to link. Things are a little different in this version. For one thing, you no longer need the underscores. Note, now I need LLs in the format string since I'll be using 64-bit quad word variables to store larger numbers. I'm using start this time. If I was using main and using Linux, perhaps Windows as well, I would need sub RSP comma 28H. Unfortunately, here it gets complicated. Windows and Linux have different calling conventions in 64-bit. Windows uses RCX, RDX, R8, and R9, and Linux uses RDI, RSI, RDX, RCX, R8, and R9. On either system, any additional parameters are pushed onto the stack. Floating point values are passed differently, but I won't cover that here. Note, now you need to add 16 to the base pointer since it's now a 64-bit return address and a 64-bit base pointer push. For Linux, you can use either int or syscall. Windows, of course, wants you to use exit process. Here's it running on Windows. Now we can go higher since a quad word can store more than a double word. And here's it running on Linux. And here's the 64-bit Linux version using just interrupts and no C functions. By the way, it's not the most elegant way to print out a number, but I wanted it to closely match my CPU's version I wrote in my other videos. And in one of my other videos, I stated that since I added a hardware user stack to my CPU design, I could have rewritten that function better, but chose to keep it the way it was. And here's it running. Now for more interesting stuff. I converted my assembly language ray tracer to x86. However, I didn't feel like doing Windows specific stuff in assembly, so I chose to use C for the graphics and window functions, and use inline assembly for the ray tracing. You could do it all in assembly, but I didn't want to tackle that at this point. You might think this is messy, but remember, I wanted it to be as close to my CPU's assembly program as possible. Later, I'll make it a little nicer. You don't have to do the stack pointer stuff in these procedures since the C compiler is doing that for you in this case. You can do naked functions if you want. In naked functions, you write the whole procedure, including the stack pointer stuff, yourself since the C compiler isn't doing it for you. You put the inline assembly in an ASM block. By the way, that's two underscores in front. There's no floating point power function, so this more indented section computes the power. I should perhaps say at this point that I chose to use just basic x86 instructions. I didn't use any 686, SSE, SSE2, etc. instructions, so these programs should run on any system. Here's another possible annoyance. FISTP by default rounds when it converts the floating point value to integer. I don't want that here. You could use FISTTP if using SS3 extensions. But as I said, I didn't want to, so I just decreased my texture offset by 0.5 to counteract the FPU's rounding. You could also change the FPU's control word to select no rounding, but if you switched it off and on again here, the program would be a little slower. Inline assembly is kind of weird in the sense that you can, to a certain extent, reference variables like you would in C. For example, accessing the image data is simpler, at least simpler than with NASM. Maybe other assemblers are like this. The brackets don't mean the same as in NASM, and if you put brackets around a variable, it doesn't change anything. And you don't need to specify the size of variables, probably because C already knows, because they are C variables after all. The rounding problem I mentioned could be dealt with this way as well. I don't call this because I don't need to, but it's here if I wanted to use it. You would call this at the beginning, assuming you never needed rounding in the program. This changes the control word to no rounding. Now the C part. Windows bitmaps scan from bottom to top rather than the usual top to bottom. They also store the red, green, and blue in reverse order. I dealt with the RGB order in the assembly code, but I didn't deal with the bottom to top situation. So here's a tip. If you specify a negative height here, Windows will take care of that. Here's another tip. When you create a window, you specify the size of the window. However, the usable client area of the window is usually less than what you specified, depending on what type of window it is. 
This is because the borders, menus, title bars, etc. take up some of the space. So, you can use Adjust Window Rect to automatically calculate the window size to use to give you the client area you desire. Here's something I put in to specify the initial settings on the command line as if you press them while running. I use Send Message to fake key down events. Here I do the message loop a little differently. This way, Run It runs more often since it's not waiting for an event. In Basic x86, there isn't an easy way to do floating point comparisons. You have to use either fcom or fcomp. By the way, the P version pops a value off the floating point stack after the comparison is done. After the comparison, you have to store the FPU's status word into a general register, such as AX. Then you test that register and jump accordingly. But what do you test it with? And on what condition do you jump? Here's a table I created that answers those questions. I'll leave it up to you to investigate, if you want, as to why this is what you do. You could also use SAHF instead of the test instruction but you're still limited by how to jump using JA, JB, JE, or JNE, and probably the instructions that are combinations of those. And if you're writing for 686 and above, you can use FCOMI with the same jump situation as with SAHF. But as I said, I wanted to use traditional x86. Here's the make file I used to compile. By the way, I use Visual Studio 6 for easy day-to-day -day stuff. It's arguably easier, and the produce code will run on pretty much any machine. And it's not a hassle to create non.NET programs. I use a newer Visual Studio compiler when necessary. And here's it running. You can select the desired scene, size, and image offset by pressing the appropriate key. So, what if you wanted a non-inline version? Well, I wasn't willing to call all the Windows functions to open Windows, do the message loop, etc., but I was willing to output files. I need some strings to deal with the files, so here they are. And I now need a menu, so here are some variables I'll need. And more menu and file variables. For the most part, the file processing code is more indented to distinguish it from the rest. Since this is now using NASM, I had to add all the D words and brackets I didn't need before. Here I create the file. The file pointer is returned in EAX, and I write the file header for a PPM file. I now call fputc rather than store the color into memory, and I close the file. I decided to use ECX instead of the stack to pass the level to trace, but I could have used the stack. This isn't the most efficient way to do menu processing, but I just wanted an excuse to learn x86's string processing instructions. I use CMPSB to compare the string in ESI to the string in EDI, comparing the number of characters that is specified in ECX. Actually, I left out the REPE instruction that should be before the CMPSB to repeat it, and also a CLD instruction before the REPE to clear the direction flag. Without the REPE, it would just compare the first character of each string. But of course, for this, that's all I need anyway. As you can see, there's no PPM files before I run it. Now I select the number of frames and the desired scene. The files were created. I'll now use an image viewer I wrote. The X command line argument turns off automatic scaling. O2 sorts the list of files into numerical order. Here's the frame scaled to the window. In part two of this video, I'll prettify the code of the inline version, as well as show modifications to the ray tracer, a converted fractal program, a converted function plotter, a converted numerical computation program, and a converted biorhythm program, and more tips. So be sure to check it out. I'll put in a link once I've uploaded it. Please subscribe, like, share, etc. And if you click subscribe, ring the bell to receive notifications of future videos.